There are about 20 games remaining in this regular season, and yet the MVP race is still completely up in the air. With Giannis, Embiid, and Jokic all having very real cases to win the award, and DeMar DeRozan and Ja Morant close behind. This got me thinking about some of the great MVP races of the past, specifically the 2008 race between Kobe Bryant and Chris Paul. Yes, there were some other candidates for the award, but this hotly debated MVP is still talked about today because of what a strong argument Chris Paul had to win the award over Kobe Bryant and his Lakers. So, I'm here to give you my opinion on this race today, who really deserved the 2008 MVP? Was Kobe Bryant right to win the award, or was Chris Paul robbed of his one chance at an MVP trophy? Let's look first at Kobe Bryant and the Lakers, shall we? Kobe led this team to 57 wins, the best record in the Western Conference, and they had the number 3 offense and number 5 defense in the entire league, leading to the number 3 overall net rating. Kobe himself put up an incredible stat line of 28, 6, and 5 with 2 steals on 46, 36, 84 shooting splits, that is 46% from the field on 21 field goal attempts, and 84% from the free throw line on 9 attempts a game. I hear a lot of people say that this was pretty much just an average Kobe Bryant season, and I think while that's not too far from the truth, it's underrated just how impressive this season was because Kobe Bryant was so damn good from 2001 to 2013. Yeah, the man put up stats like this every year, but he's a top 10 player of all time because he was so freaking good for such a long period. This man could have won MVP a whole bunch of times in his career, and you shouldn't look down on this season just because he may have had other better years. The MVP race is not dependent on other seasons of a player's career. All that matters is how they played in that season, and in 2008, Kobe Bryant played pretty freaking good. Next up, you got Pau Gasol on this team, who only played 27 games as he was a trade deadline acquisition, but in those games, he gave you 19 points and 8 rebounds on a very efficient 59% shooting from the field and 80% from the free throw line. He was a perfect second star next to Kobe Bryant. This was the guy Kobe needed to finally get his team to the NBA Finals. Lamar Odom was the number three on this Lakers team, the number two before Gasol got there, and I think he, this is someone who's becoming underrated as time goes on. No, Odom never made an all-star team, but he was on the verge of one for several years, including this one, where he gave you 14 points and 11 rebounds, along with four assists, one steal and one block, and he shot 53% from the field. Odom was a very good finisher, a very, very good defender and rebounder, and a pretty good passer slash playmaker. He was a great defensive piece, a great piece on both ends of this team, really, and I just feel like over time, his importance to these Lakers titles runs is starting to be forgotten. Next up, you had Andrew Bynum, who, at only 20 years old, was already looking like a future star center in the NBA. He was giving you 13, 10, and 2 blocks on 64% shooting. No, he did not space the floor, didn't give you really anything outside the paint, but he was so dang good under the basket that it didn't really matter, while also being a very good defensive player. Speaking of good defensive players, you've already got Kobe. You've already got Odom, you've already got Bynum, and then you put in Derek Fisher, who at 33 years old was starting to exit his prime, but he was still one of the most consistent players in the league. He didn't do anything unexpected, you weren't going to see him drop, you know, a 25-point game on some crazy shooting or anything, but he gave you 12 points, he was a consistently good defender, he made his open threes, he did everything you needed him to do, and people, just in case, uh, uh, 
you know, you're one of those people who's like, oh, he's the point guard, why does he only have three assists? It's important to remember that Phil Jackson is a coach who generally didn't have point guards averaging a ton of assists, that's just not the way he ran his system, so I would not blame Derek Fisher for his low assist numbers. This is a very good starting five on both ends of the floor, and when you get to the bench, it's not great, but it's not bad either. I would say this is pretty middling depth. You had Kwame Brown, who we're not even going to meme on today. People have done enough to this man. Look, he wasn't a great player. Let's move on. Luke Walton was also on the bench before he became one of the worst coaches in the NBA. He was an okay bench player, he gave you 7 points, he shot 45% from the field, he was alright. And you had 3 3-point three shooters who really challenged my white ass and my ability to pronounce last names. You had Vladimir Radmanovich, Jordan Farmar, and Sasha Vujacic? Vujacic, I think it's Sasha Vujacic, alright? These three guys each gave you about 8 to 9 points a game and shot pretty darn well from three. They all shot over league average, with Sasha shooting 44% from three on four attempts a game. He was a very good shooter. They all took about four threes a game. They were three-point shooting role players. They did their thing. Not too much to say, but good pieces to have around a team that really did lack three-point shooting in the starting lineup. This was not as much of an issue in 2008 as it would be today, but it still is important to note that this team did not have a whole lot of floor spacing, especially amongst its starters. Moving on to the New Orleans Hornets, you have a team who Chris Paul carried one win behind the Lakers in the West with 56. They had the number five offense and number seven defense in the league, giving them the fifth overall net rating. And Chris Paul himself had a phenomenal season even by his standards. This was, hands down in my opinion, the best season of Chris Paul's career. He was giving you an efficient 21 points, 12 assists, and 3 steals. The man was great on both ends. He was the best playmaker in the league, yes, better than Steve Nash, arguably the best playmaker, or sorry, not playmaker, I don't think, but the best pure passer of all time. I think he has a real case to be top three behind Magic Johnson, and there's a couple guys you can place it to, but he is so freaking good. 12 assists with only 2.5 turnovers is historically insane, and he's actually gotten better since then. This man is so good at not turning the ball over while winging it all over the place, I, I just wanted to point that out there. I think that's a really underrated aspect of Chris Paul's game. Now, I said an efficient 21 points, and I meant it. He shot 49, 37, and 85 shooting splits. He was efficient in the mid-range. He was a killer. He was a great finisher at the rim. He very much could hit wide-open threes when he needed to, and when he got to the free-throw line, he made his free throws. He was a phenomenal leader for this team, and he really made his teammates better. David West had probably the best season of his career. He gave you 21 and 9 with a steal, 48% from the field, sorry I had to catch my breath there, and 85% from the free throw line himself. He was a legitimate Western Conference All-Star this season, and the number two on this team behind Chris Paul. Now, after these two players, it's a little bit of a myth that Chris Paul did not have any help whatsoever on this Hornets team, and that's just not true. You had two other very good players in the starting lineup in Tyson Chandler and Peja Stojakovic. Tyson Chandler was not quite the peak version of himself we would see a few years down the road, but he was already a very good player at the age of 25. He gave you 12 points and 12 rebounds. You didn't expect too much from him on offense. He shot efficiently from the floor, but he was just catching lobs and doing putbacks. You know, typical role player center stuff. But on the defensive end, this man was already a rim protecting menace. He anchored the paint for a team that really didn't have that much defense outside of Paul and Chandler. These two were elite defenders, and everybody else was pretty mediocre to bad. 
Speaking of not being a great defender, Peja Stojakovic was on this team. This is another player like Odom, who has become very underrated over the years. He was a legit all-star at his peak, and now on the Hornets at 30 years old, he was the third option on offense. He gave you a very efficient 16 points a game, shot 44% from three on seven attempts, which is unheard of in 2008. Like, even today, those would be some impressive shooting numbers. So for him to shoot that many threes on such high efficiency back then, a fantastic offensive piece next to Chris Paul. But after those four players, this roster really starts to fall off. Morris Peterson rounds out the starting five. He only played 24 minutes a game, and he was a decent player. He, you know, he was, a, he was a, an okay fifth man. He gave you eight points. He was a decent three-point shooter. That's kind of all he did, and when you go to the bench, this bench was pretty weak. There are guys here, I guarantee you have not heard all of these names. Bonsai Wells, Bobby Jackson, Gennaro Pargo, you don't know who these players are. I barely know who these players are, and I did research for this video. What I know they were, were not great three-point shooters, not great at really anything, not the kinds of bench players you expect from a team with 57 wins in an incredibly tough Western Conference. So Chris Paul, while he did have three very good players in the starting lineup with him, really did not have any depth beyond those players on the rest of the team. So, looking at the overall teams, Chris Paul, best season of his career, really carried his team, best playmaker in the NBA, very efficient. Kobe Bryant, very efficient himself, especially considering the volume. Both players were great defenders. I would give a little bit of an edge to Paul there. Bryant was just a phenomenal scorer. He led his team to more wins, but I mean, it's such a slim margin, does it really matter? So who won the MVP? Well, if we are talking about pure value, all right, if you want to say the player who was the most valuable to their own team winning, I would say that the award goes to Chris Paul here, mostly because of how his roster was constructed and how Chris Paul played. CP3, with his incredible playmaking and leadership, is someone who really, really elevates players around him, especially two types. You've got three-point shooting role players who he kicks out to wide-open looks, and you've got phenomenal post players who finish well around the rim, like Tyson Chandler, and get a bunch of easy lobs and shots right there under the basket. Chris Paul made these guys as good as they were. Not saying they were bad players, but even David West himself said that Chris Paul was really a big part of why he was so good while he was on these Hornets teams. He made these guys' lives so much easier than they would have been without him. Not that Kobe Bryant wasn't doing the same to an extent on the Lakers, but I do believe that Chris Paul's impact was greater on his individual teammates. Now, with that said, I like to look at these MVP races based off real MVP criteria and not the BS people like to use where they go, well, what does valuable really mean? The way the MVP race has always been has been the best player on the best team due to a variety of factors. Impact matters, winning matters, roster matters. Looking at Kobe Bryant's Lakers, the key here is consistency. When you look at their overall lineup, Excuse me. Yes, he definitely had more help than Paul, but what he did not have is consistent help. Pau Gasol, like I said, only played in 27 games this season. He was a trade deadline acquisition, and it's also important to note that Andrew Bynum only played in 35 games this season as he was dealing with injuries throughout the year. So two of Kobe's three best teammates only played for one-third or less of the entire season. While he did have a better bench a little bit, he did have better help when this team was at their peak, I think that this difference in games played between their teammates is what gives Kobe Bryant the edge, for me, for this MVP race. Chris Paul was an incredible player. I think if he had won the NBA, uh, MVP, it wouldn't be by any means a robbery. But for my money, Kobe Bryant did in fact deserve the 2008 MVP for leading his team to a tiny bit more wins while being a slightly better player 
due to circumstances outside his control such as teammate injuries, which made his job just a little bit more difficult than Chris Paul's was. Kobe deserved the 2008 MVP.